Ave Maria. Jesus came to Nazara, where he'd been brought up, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as he usually did. He stood up to read, and they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me, for he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives and to the blind new sight, to set the downtrodden free, to proclaim the Lord's year of favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the assistant, and sat down. And all eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to speak to them. This text is being fulfilled today, even as you listen. And she won the approval of all, and they were astonished by the gracious words that came from his lips. They said, This is Joseph's son, surely. But he replied, No doubt you will call to me the same. Physician, heal yourself, and tell me, We have heard all that happened in Capernaum. Do the same here in your own countryside. And he went on, I tell you solemnly, no prophet is ever accepted in his own country. There were many widows in Israel, I can assure you, in Elijah's day, when heaven remained shut for three years and six months, and the great famine raged through the land. But Elijah was not sent to any one of these. He was sent to widow at Zarephtha, a Sidonian town. And in the prophet Elisha's time, there were many lepers in Israel, but none of these was cured, except the Syrian, Naaman. When they heard this, Everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They sprang to their feet, hustled him out of the town, and they took him up to the brow of the hill their town was built on, intending to throw him down the cliff. But he slipped through the crowds and walked away. St. Jerome tells us to be ignorant of the scriptures is to be ignorant of Christ. And that, being true, means that we should spend some time reading the scriptures each day and every day. The Mass is not the place where we study the scriptures. We come to Mass to worship God. However, because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, it is necessary that we spend a little time reflecting on the scriptures and what I hope is that the way the, I explain, I attempt to explain the scriptures, you in turn will be able to read the scriptures by yourself and so learn with the assistance of the Holy Spirit to grasp Christ who is revealed to us in the Word of God. We begin reading from St. Luke's Gospel and um, I'm following the, the um, gospel as it is in the lectionary, so not necessarily the gospel from the Mass. So we, we begin St. Luke's Gospel in the fourth chapter. The three evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, approach the revelation uh, in a similar manner. So they follow the human nature of our Lord. St. John focuses on the divine nature. In the, that doesn't mean, of course, that the divine nature is hidden in the first three or that the human in, the, in St. John. But the emphasis is such. St. Matthew gives us a particular emphasis. He goes into greater detail. St. Luke um, fills in the gaps that St. Matthew leaves out, and vice versa sometimes. Our Lord, we're told by St. Luke, came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he'd been brought up and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as he usually did. So he was brought up in Nazareth, and he went to the synagogue as every Jew did. When we read St. Matthew's Gospel, St. Matthew tells us that our Lord went to Capernaum. This is after his baptism. He went to Capernaum 
And there he worked many miracles, the healing of the leper, the healing of the centurion, and so on. Well, St. Luke skips this, this over, but at the same time, he tells us why. So he, St. Luke, he went to Nazareth, went to the synagogue, as he usually did. He stood up to read. That was perfectly normal. And they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Why? Well, first of all, they had heard what he did in Capernaum. We, see, we heard that a little in, in the Gospel passage. Do hear in your own countryside what you did in Capernaum, they said. So they'd heard about what he'd done there. They chose, Saint, um, they chose the prophet Isaiah in God's providence because the prophet Isaiah was the most difficult of the prophets to understand, to interpret. And the test of a real teacher, rabbi, was how he interpreted Isaiah. So we told our Lord, on rolling the scroll, found the place. So our Lord very deliberately went to the particular passage of Isaiah. It was a passage recognized as referring to the Messiah. And he reads it, the Spirit of the Lord has been given to me. He has anointed me. He sent me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives, blind, to the blind new sight, to set the downtrodden free, and proclaim the Lord's year of favor. And then he rolls back the scroll and gives it to the assistant and sits down. Now the background to that passage is that it referred to Cyrus the king. The Jews were in captivity in Babylon. They had been praying to God to set them free. The 70 years had passed. God then raised up Cyrus, and Cyrus was going to issue a decree by which the Jews could return to Jerusalem, to Judea, to their homeland. So the literal interpretation is, that Cyrus has been anointed, I have anointed my servant Cyrus, says the prophet, to send, to bring good news to the poor, literally the, the, the Jews who were suffering in Babylon, to proclaim liberty to captives, to the blind, new sight, because they were in, in their captivity, um, blind. They now began to understand why they were in captivity, they were downtrodden because they were not in their own land, and to proclaim the Lord's year of favor, the freedom that was to come. But the Jews also recognized this applied to the Messiah, namely that he, the anointed one, the Lord has anointed me, would send his, his, his savior, his redeemer, the Messiah, to bring good news to the poor the Gentiles, for the Gentiles had neither the law, they did not know God, <clears throat> they did not know the law, they had no prophets to proclaim liberty to captives, all those who were overburdened with sin or who found difficulty in observing the law of Moses, to give new sight, there was hope to set the downtrodden free, all the whole human race, and to proclaim the Lord's year of favor, the jubilee, when on the 50th year, all debts were erased, all those who were captives were released. So we who had been indebted to God because of our sins, we who had been excluded from the kingdom, now we were free to return. And so the Lord rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the assistant, and everybody's listening because they want to know how is he going to interpret this text? And so, he began to speak. And his words are, this text is being fulfilled today, even as you listen. So he's declaring himself to be the Messiah. And he, they told, he won the approval of all because they were astonished at his eloquence, the gracious words that came from his mouth. He was convincing of what he had said. But what is now, what's going to happen is what will happen all through our Lord's ministry. They said, 
This is Joseph's son, surely. In other words, he's a carpenter. He's not been educated. How come he's saying these things? And our Lord, knowing their hearts, expresses the underlying reason for them saying this. No doubt you will quote to me the saying, physician, heal yourself. In other words, <clears throat> if you have really any real concern for the sick, then you yourself should not be sick. Look, you have done, you have done these things elsewhere, well, do them here as well. And, tell, and you will tell me, the Lord continues, we have heard all that happened in Capernaum. Do the same here in your own countryside. Physician, heal yourself. The Lord went on, I tell you solemnly, no prophet is ever accepted in his own country. So already he's warning them that they are being insincere. And then he goes on to drive the point home. He speaks, his purpose is to declare himself the Messiah. So he's going to drive that point home again to them. There were many widows, he says, in Israel during Elijah's day when the great famine raged. And Elijah was not sent to any one of these. He was sent rather to the widow at Zarephtha, a Sidonian town. So what has this got to do with anything? Well, the widow was a Gentile. Elijah had come and he, he was making his way to the, to the um, wadi, to the, to the little stream where there was still the water. And the widow is, is collecting sticks. So Elijah said to her, bake me, um, give me a drink of water. And she's going off to get the water. And he says, and bring me something to eat. She said, I have nothing to eat except a little flour and a little oil. And I'm going to bake some cakes with it for my son and myself to eat, and then we're going to die. In other words, that's all we have. Elijah said to her, do as you say, but bring some to me first. And the widow does exactly that. And the prophet then goes on to say, God has said that the, the flour will not um, run out, nor will the oil cease until the end of the famine. And of course, exactly happens. She has um, enough f food for herself and her son. But what is the meaning of this? She was willing to give, to put the profit before her own needs. And so our Lord is saying the same thing to the people in Nazareth. He says, I am going to put... Um, you, you are refusing to put the needs, God's message first before your own needs, and therefore you're going to lose out, essentially is what he's saying. And the same way, he says, in Elisha's time, there were many lepers in Israel, but the only one who was called, cured was a foreigner, Naaman, a Syrian, for the same reason, that the message is going to be taken away from the Jews because of inf insincerity and infidelity, but it's going to be given to the Gentiles, the foreigners, us. And they immediately, the people in the synagogue immediately understand what he's saying. He's saying essentially that they're insincere, they, they, um, they are um, hard-hearted, that they are going to reject him because they despise his origin, the son of a carpenter. And when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. How dare you claim to be the Messiah, was what they were saying. And they sprang to their feet, hustled him out of the town with the intention of throwing him from the brow of the hill their town was built on. They regarded him as blaspheming. The penalty for blasphemy was, in fact, to stone the person to death. Well, whether you stone the person or whether you throw the person on stones, the result is the same. 
And so we have, for instance, Stephen, as we know, was stoned. St. James was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple onto stones. So here we have the first attempt on our Lord's life. And sadly, it's in the very place that he grew up, in Nazareth. And we will find, as we follow St. Luke again and again, that it's an attempt to, imp to impede him, to, 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 frust to frustrate his work, and there's a rejection. But our Lord is destined not to die in Nazareth or Capernaum, but rather to die in Jerusalem and to die by crucifixion. And so whenever these attempts are made on his life, we're told he slipped through the crowd and walked away, which of course is also miraculous. How can one man escape a crowd of people who are attempting to make an attempt on his life? But he did, and he will do this again and again um, to show us that no one could take his life from him, but he will lay it down at the proper time. Let us then ask St. Luke to assist us as we travel through his gospel so that we might know Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I mean, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit.